Hi, welcome to Dev Central. My name is Jason, and today I have with me Joe. Joe, how are you? I'm good. Hey, Jason. Good deal. And John, as always, uh, John, how are you? I am uh, staring out my window, watching it snow right now, and there's probably <laughs> 12 to 15 inches on the ground, which we're in the middle of the uh, uh, the infamous polar vortex. So I'm, uh, but I'm inside. And I'm warm, and so I'm doing good. Good deal. We need some of that polar vortex out here so we can get some snow on the mountains, get our ski, wow. ski resorts now open. Now I, know, I, I was a little concerned. I, I started checking the ski resorts out there, and, and Snoqualmie is closed. And I'm like, no, because it's like my, probably my only winter trip out there is going to be at the end of January. So I'm, I'm going to have to go yeah. somewhere. I might, might have to take a day and drive up to Vancouver. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Bring your passport. I, I heard Whistler's not yeah. that great either. Um, folks went up there uh, over the holiday break and said that it was just patchwork of snow and dirt. And um, the lifts were all open, but it was just really horrible skiing. Wow. So uh, is it just that the, uh, the the jet screen the jet stream is kind of bypassing the the west coast right now? What, what what's the weather pattern? I don't know. We're just not getting the not getting the snow that we've we've had in the past. Um, we've had some we've had some cold weather. Just the no rain to come in. So n need rain and cold to make snow. So we're either getting one or the other around here lately. But the two of them haven't been uh, timed together very yeah. well. Well, you know, we we normally get uh, the the way the pattern works here in our part of St. Louis is you know we're kind of right where the Gulf Gulf. Uh, Water comes up and the cold fronts come through and and usually north and west of St. Louis gets nailed and, and we get a dusting or ice, uh, but this this storm hit us pretty good and we got about you know as John said 12 to 15 on the ground and I was like we have as much snow in my front yard as they have at Snoqualmie. There's something wrong in the world. No doubt. So, no <laughs> doubt. <laughs> well, anyway, we can get on to stuff that people really uh, care about. Not. Not our own uh, desires for, for snow to be on the ground. But uh, um, first article I wanted to talk about real quick is uh, the pinhole DNS. Um, and Joel Moses, who is uh, one of our uh, F5 extraordinaires, uh, was one of our MVPs before he joined uh, the F5 team. And uh, he posted a solution out on the wiki uh, that essentially allows you to uh, intercept DNS requests on the way to your DNS servers or replace uh, what would be a DNS server. And and provide answers back and and his solution used the DNS license that comes uh, or that you can get uh, as an add-on with LTM it comes with GTM and and allows you to interact at an iRule level uh, with with DNS and uh, it was a, it was way more robust of a solution than I needed for my um, uh, for my solution so I I took uh, something that Nat uh, who is also an F fiber built out of uh, some binary decodes. Uh, playing around with the uh, the DNS protocol, and so I took the base of that and just started uh, building out manually a, res a, a request response, and that got very taxing. Uh, building out all the okay, I need the hex, you know, converting ASCII to hex so that I can get the answer right, so that it can be binary formatted properly, and and so then I ended up writing a uh, a Python script for that. Uh, to build those uh, translations for me, uh, but I want to share the, out the um, yeah there we go. So you know what it allows you to do is is in our in, in an APM solution you set the DNS server that I'm passing back to the clients as my virtual that is serving up the DNS, and and then if I have a custom answer for that I'll provide it. Otherwise I just forward it back to my DNS servers which is a, a nice way to allow mobile clients to be able to use um, uh, DNS that you wouldn't necessarily release to the public because unlike a, a Mac or Linux or Windows on on an unjailbreaked iPhone or, or an Android device you can't uh, you can't manipulate the host tables on on those platforms without without breaking them well actually Android you probably can but but all the iStuff platforms you can't you can't do it and so it's a, a, a nice hack to be able to to do that. So Joel's is definitely a far more robust production version, uh, but for my niche use case, uh, this made a lot of sense. And uh, there's the Python script if you if you really want to go uh, through and, and build out something like that. That way you don't have to manually decode the binary and all that stuff. So manual decoding is fun though. 
it, it's it's fun for a time, and then it's tedious, <laughs> and then and that that's the time you build the script and make it happen. So. <laughs> but anyway, that was that was a, a cool little project to work on, and and met a need for us to be able to do some some end user testing on on mobile platforms for uh, some some stuff we're working on for the near future. And uh, so anyway, ne next article we have is uh, breaking up with your identity. It's not me, it's you. So John, you wanna, you wanna talk about uh, Nathan's uh, blog post a little bit? Yeah, Nathan Pierce, one of our um, senior technical marketing managers posted a, uh, a great article on Dev Central a few days ago. And he, he essentially talked about the uh, identity issues on the internet. And he, started, he starts off the article saying that He's glad his grandmother is not on the internet, uh, <laughs> and so uh, anyway, he he uh, he talks about how you can create these online identities, whether it's a uh, email address or his his uh, his Twitter, um, you know his his Twitter name is uh, is Pierce. It's at Pierce Nathan, and uh, he said it kind of weirded him out that actually at Nathan Pierce followed him one time. <laughs> it's, it felt like he was kind of being followed by himself. Um, but, uh, well, but that's, anyway. what I, that's what I do. Yeah. Create all forms and different accounts, and then follow myself, so so that's, I can have followers. Yeah, that's, that's why Joe has so many followers. Yeah, exactly. Or none. And that, yeah, and that's why two. you get that's why you get so many emails from yourself. Yeah, as well. <laughs> that's right. But no, so Nathan, he 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 goes over this uh, this scenario, this real life, you know, incident that happened. He signed up for a Gmail account back in kind of its beta version when a lot of usernames or a lot of uh, names were still available, and um, and then after that, this guy, this Nathan Pierce uh, kind of guy, signed up for a Gmail account as well. And one one little known um, uh, thing that that happens with Gmail accounts is how it handles the period. And Nathan goes over this in the uh, in the article, but how it handles the period uh, in a in a username before the little at sign in the email address. So, for example, first last at gmail.com is the is the same as first dot last at gmail.com. So this uh, this this Nathan Pierce signs up for an email address, and essentially all the emails go to our Nathan Pierce. And so he <laughs> he talks about how he's getting you know different magazine subscriptions, and he really appreciates the heavy metal head making <laughs> stuff, as well as uh, corn corn farming uh, you know details that he never knew that he even cared about. And so uh, so anyway, so he kind of he, he uh, apparently this other Nathan Pierce goes online or, or calls up a, a travel agency, books a you know books a trip somewhere, and. Anyway, there's this whole mess up, and so Nathan basically at the end of it goes goes over the fact that you know, hey, even though um, even though we're we're such a tech savvy uh, society today, and and there's all these security checks in place that even still things can go wrong fairly quickly, and uh, and even though there's different you know validation checks to make sure you are who you say you are when you book a ticket or when you you know get a uh, you know get an email for something, then uh, still be careful out there. Because uh, it's uh, it's not completely foolproof, so yeah, it, it, was a, using, it was a fun using thing. Using email address as a uh, a final sanity checkpoint, but you're, right. you're relying on the the user who typed it in to type it in correctly. Uh, that is so correct. In this case, with uh, with Nathan um, um, Cornhole, whatever um, hacker guy. <laughs> Corn um, metal, yeah. Corn metal, yes. <laughs> Corn hole packers. Set up, set up a different conversation. Different, set, yeah. Set, that's, a, that's a different podcast, Joe. Corn <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, I, I've got Beavis and Butthead on my mind. I'm sorry. Um, you know, he went up and signed up for an account and uh, put in Nathan's email. So the the question is, um, you know, when you go and you sign up for accounts, you sign up uh, on your bank. Let's say you want to set up a profile on your your home mortgage loan, things like that. You're typing in your email address, but Nathan's point is that there's not any two-factor authentication on that. They're treating that as gold, and uh, then the 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 company is start sending out. Um, Links to rechanging your password and doing all that, and that's how it's it's verified. So Nathan called in and said, "Hey, do something about this." And they said, "Well, there's nothing we can do." And he said, "Okay, I'm going to log in and I'm going to change and I'm going to re I'm going to book a bunch of trips and I'm going to do all that, and I'm going to post something online that says that you enabled me to do that." <laughs> so I think they kind of corrected things and disabled the account at that point. But I think there's a bigger picture, and folks, um, you know, when I think there there is some issues with relying on 
just an email address, right? And uh, yeah. Nathan finished it off saying, I'm never going to get my grandparents online just because these things are too confusing for them and there's too much risk. Uh, yeah. And I think that's true. It's you, you, you can your email address and think you're all right, but uh, um, in the most cases you are, but if you type one extra character and somebody goes in and um, creates an account or has an account for that, they're going to start getting your emails and be able to get access to the system, and that's the key access to log in to all these things. So yeah. it is a hole that I think down the road needs to get addressed. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. And I, and I think. Oh, go ahead, John. Well, I was just going to say I didn't realize that little nuance about Gmail and how they handled the uh, the periods. You know, and you're. I'm going to start using that. That's okay. awesome. <laughs> exactly. I mean, a, a lot of people, myself included, would have thought that those would have been different email addresses, but they're not. So. Yeah, you can almost use that instead of setting up 50 different emails to see how different companies that you sign up for things uh, yeah. sell your information. Now you can just like move the period around in your in your first yeah. uh, in in the initial part so that you can figure out who who's sending you what from where. Um, but you know the other thing that you can do, and I've started doing this, uh, enabling two-factor authentication on on all my accounts, like logging into Google, logging into yeah. uh, my LastPass account, log, logging into Dropbox. Um, and I have a Google Authenticator for some of those uh, as uh, YubiKey. Just like I wrote an article on using the YubiKey for two-factor authentication um, mm -hmm. is accepted. At Can some I see place. that keychain again? Can yeah, you put that in your pocket. I'm kind of yeah, getting um, George Costanza look here with your wallet. Yeah. So you, well, Jay, you got yeah, the George got Costanza wallet too. You know, the Cardinals in 2011 got that little medallion. That's my. A little keyhole. Nice. <laughs> yeah, it, it is getting big. It's getting out of control. He can so. get into anywhere. Which that lead, Jason, that leads into your uh, your discussion, maybe here in a minute about how you can use your phone for uh, access yeah. to tons you know, of stuff. Since, since it's a nice segue, we can go ahead and skip over into that one, and then we'll come back and talk about Lori's article. But yeah, okay. uh, I wrote a just it's a very <laughs> quick blog. I was reading yesterday on uh, on uh, TechCrunch, and they were talking about. A new product that's coming out called Revolve, and it's a kind of a, a, a hub for smart devices in your home. So whether it's lights or you know your stove or coffee maker or uh, your smoke detectors or whatever, it's a uh, a lot of them have their own apps, uh, but they won't necessarily talk uh, to each other. And so this Revolve device is supposed to allow you to have all those devices talk to it. And then you have one app, so it's a single pane of glass to be able to access all of your smart things um, in your house. Uh, but it also introduces uh, the ability to have triggers, and so you can trigger on, you know, say, you know, two o'clock, turn lights on. That, that's that part's no, not very new, but uh, but also uh, like a proximity trigger, and that caught my eye. It's like whoa. <laughs> so you know, if your phone gets close enough to the house, things start happening. Um, and uh, or you know it could be a different trigger, but you know I, I don't know that if I'm running in my neighborhood and I run on the block behind me, but I get close enough to my house that I want my front door unlocking. You know I only want that happening when I'm in the driveway, but you know based on a on a proximity of say you know 20 yards, 30 yards, you know that could unlock any time. And if you want it longer, like you know if I want if I turn the corner and when I want my garage door to come open and I want my door to unlock so that I'm not inconvenienced by the five seconds of <laughs> touching the lock for it to unlock when I get out of the car. Yeah. You know, and, and convenience has a price, and uh, I just it, it those kinds of things are neat, uh, but alarming at the same time. So. Yeah. Fascinating. Uh, yeah, I had that issue once that uh, when our power went out. Um, well, actually, with the power out, it wouldn't have helped me. But, okay, never mind. Um, I, I left my keys in the house, and it's like, how do I get in the house now? Um, but if I had no yeah. power, I couldn't use a proximity device. Never mind. Roll that back. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, in, you know, another issue with proximity is GPS and, and the, the issues with how accurate that is. And um, I think there's lots of – there's there's products. Uh, Steven on our team talked about how he's looking at doing some automation things for his house with – automated locks and he gives each kid a, a key fob that is um, now that's not using um, any internet and all of that but it is using local proximity if the devices connect each other so he can be triggered when his kids all leave and if all the devices are out of the house the house locks itself and if they come up and it unlocks it knows who they are but you're right it, it boils down to the, the who, whoever has that fob and if some if somebody dropped it and walked up the house it would it would open up um, yeah and so, I guess that's no different than somebody losing their keys and having the key but 
but yeah. still, uh, it's some, something to be aware of if you're if you're going to automate your house to the point you have cameras in every room. You know, if you have cameras in any room, I, I highly suggest you go uh, watch the the Black Hat <laughs> uh, IP camera uh, takedown uh, video, and you you might not be the only one viewing those video feeds. So that's that's probably true. That was a good article. Was, yeah, I don't say if there's. I, I have a Nest thermostat in my house. Um, I just bought the Nest um, smoke detector. I've got one of those. Um, testing them out. Uh, there was a Kickstarter that I that I bought into. It was kind of home automation, so it, it kind of does similar to this project you're talking about. But they've got a, a service layer on top of um, different automated products in the house. There's online. There's Ift. I F T T T. If this then that. Mm -hmm. And they're extending their, uh, it's basically an online uh, rule engine. If something happens, do something. They're extending their reach out to internet connected devices. So Nest is on there as well now. So you can do things like if I tweet this message, then go and change my Nest thermostat to this or that. Um, there's some interesting things that can come around, but you're right. It's Your home should be your sanctuary. It should you should be able to lock it down, and and right. these are kind of creating pseudo backdoors, so to say. So, yeah, absolutely. Interesting yeah. to see. It'll be interesting to see as as more of these devices come out. You know, this year with CES, uh, the computer consumer or computer electronic show, consumer electronic show, the bigger biggest stories that people are saying are the Internet of Things, having connected devices and bracelets and and um, things that you wear or your home appliances and how everything's getting internet sized and I think that security on that in the next year or two is going to be pretty interesting. It definitely, and it's going to be interesting too to see you know uh, the the movies that come out of Hollywood with smart houses and you know horror, horror flicks with uh, related to, to smart homes. Yeah, yeah. Holding holding people captive in their own house. You know, you need the like the the actual <laughs> AI robots. It's just the 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 house itself at that point. Well, yeah. What happens? What happens when you get rid of all the keys and you all have uh, electronic locks, and then the locks decide not to let you in anymore? <laughs> you exactly. You're, break, you're breaking windows, and then the you know the poison darts are flying across the room at you. <laughs> the house turns against you. That could be a well, good that, movie. That's when J uh, Jason can use that big key ring and just throw it yeah. through the window. You know, that's, true. That, that's another benefit of that huge keychain. <laughs> It's, it's getting big. It's not that big. It's, it's, well, it's not even racquetball size. Well, maybe it is racquetball. The problem size. is all yeah. the the key, car key fobs and how big those are getting each yeah. one. So when you've got a couple of cars that you're keying in and then a house They're key, enormous. it adds up. Yeah, yeah. My, my expedition key fob is out of control. I mean, look at the size of this key. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's as big as the expedition. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I digress. Let's awesome. let's get back on track. Yeah. Sorry, um, Joe. You want to talk about uh, Lori's? Uh, uh, what about SDN uh, with sure. regard to uh, synthesis? Sure. So F5 synthesis was uh, F5's approach at, at looking at the offerings we have and starting to think about things in a different way, thinking about uh, the network and network not as much network devices and products, whether it's big IP or or we talked about DNS, 3 DNS uh, or GTM. God, I'm old school, 3DNS, uh, GTM or, or APM and those things. But thinking less about products and more about solutions. And what are, what are types of uh, issues that customers have and how do we solve those problems with, um, with solutions? And these include reference architectures that use our products under the seam, but it's not, it's not anymore about what checkboxes we have or what, what uh, license keys and this kind of thing. It's what do you want to solve? And here's the here's the menu on how you can solve these problems. Well, uh, so the, our, Lori wrote an article about what about SDN with synthesis, and I guess the point here is for folks looking at S SDN software defined networking, um, that essentially is a solution, a kind of a prescriptive guidance across um, software or divine networks and defining your network around soft software and applications and that kind of thing. So where does synthesis lie in with that? Uh, does it replace it? Does it uh, complement it? It's um, So we don't really address that directly on our synthesis uh, website and the promotions on it. So her article here is basically saying some of the ins, ins and outs of, of SDN and, and how it addresses different types of things at, at different layers of the stack. And 
um, you know, the point here is that F5 synthesis architecture is just, uh, it, it's very complementary with um, SDN as defined by various vendors and their deployments on them. And Lori's got a nice little stack here that uh, utilizes using Big IQ, which is our management product for helping deploy things around and automate things around the network. Um, to whether and our our devices kind of fit into that whole framework there. So um, you know the answer really is SDN doesn't replace our uh, synthesis does not replace SDN. It's very complementary and we tie in and we work very well with. Uh, various vendors, if you look at the announcements that went along with Synthesis, all the SDN vendors that are providing, um, they're working very closely with us and we're, we're providing joint solutions that integrate with theirs. So it's, the goal is that it's very complementary. We're not, we're not out to replace SDN. We're not out to be your SDN vendor, but we're out to be, you know, we'll provide a solution if you have our, our gear, but also if you have other uh, companies and, and organizations deployments and architectures in place. The goal here is to work very complementary with them. So yeah, that's absolutely. Kind of I think what she's getting at. Yeah, yeah, good, good call. Yeah, the, it, the the synthesis fits into that. You know, whether it's a traditional fabric or an SDN fabric, it it, it plays in both worlds. Yep. So, so yeah, Lori's got a good a, a lot of uh, in this. Uh, this series on th synthesis, she talks about um, SDAS, software-defined application services, interoperability, um, reference architectures, all of that. So I'd, I'd recommend checking some of those things out because it's, it's, it's good reading. It's got about 10 or so articles now. Yeah. Good deal. Well, any parting thoughts, guys, before we, we call it a day? Oh, happy New Year, everyone. Yeah. yeah. That at the beginning. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Happy 2014. Yeah, yep. Good deal. Well, uh, until next week, guys. Thanks for joining. And then I guess in uh, three week, three weeks we'll we'll get to do this uh, all together. So yeah, that's the deal. That should be fun. Rock and roll, man. We'll see you guys later. Take care. Awesome. Bye.